and I used to play chess against myself, and I never expected into the breach to rekindle that memory. In middle school I was happy enough to play Tetris, Mario and Pokemon on my red brick, but I didn't know what I really wanted was an interesting system to explore. I didn't have a PC, I hadn't even heard of games like XCOM or Civilization. What I had was a chess set and a basic knowledge of the rules, and the countless possibilities of that 8x8 wooden world blew me away. It was set up a random position, or one from a book, and then analyzed the board, trying to find the best moves for both sides, like a child playing with action figures in his sandbox. The child can happily sit in his sandbox for hours without getting bored. Well, until he grows up anyway. Later, I too discovered the magic of video games and switched from a physical sandbox to a vast virtual one. By that time, chess had become a grind. The chess video games I knew were programs built to train and analyze matches. They didn't expect anything else, since bringing chess to the digital world is just a technological challenge. Chess played on a computer remains the same abstract tactical board game. Once you learn how something works, you cannot relieve the excitement of the discovery. Now we have countless graphical variations, from high polygon counterproduction of a wooden set to military and fantasy figures materializing the imagination of children playing with toys. Moreover, chess engines like Deep Blue already establish the superiority of machines over humans, a preview of our future robot overlords. Is that all video games can do? A brand new medium used to simulate a fancy chess set with a strong opponent behind it? While Kickstarters have proven that many people want games to recreate experiences, projects like Ukulele show that reproducing mechanically the object of nostalgia is not enough. We changed, and the game must reflect that. Now we have countless pieces of entertainment just a few clicks away. So the question is, is it possible to translate chess into the fast-paced language of today's video games? Is it possible to relieve the magic of learning chess from the basics in a condensed experience? Enter into the breach. If I have to describe Into the Breach in a sentence now, I'd say it is a chess-like sandbox with a built-in puzzle generator. The first impression, though, is quite different. It presents itself as a tactical turn-based game with a campaign of variable length and some roguelike elements encouraging multiple playthroughs. You control a squad of three mechs, robot defenders built thanks to the effort of human and android pilots, traveling across timelines to try and save them from a mysterious insectoid menace called the Vec. The spectacle of the battles between countless kaiju and your mechs that will decide the future of Earth is left to the imagination in a pixelated rendition of a city under siege by giant insects, just as a chess match simulates the clash of two medieval armies on an 8x8 board. Storytelling is as simple and straightforward as the visuals, as it leaves you free to make your own stories by playing with virtual action figures over and over again while unlocking new mech squads and pilots. Pilots are basically upgrades with a personality. They can be equipped to any mech and gain experience during each campaign to unlock simple abilities such as extra movement, though mechs can still function on their own thanks to a built-in basic AI. If a mech is destroyed during a mission, it won't move in the remaining turns, but it will be ready for the next deployment, fully repaired. The pilots are not so lucky, and you might lose them for the rest of the run, though a replacement can randomly appear alongside new weapons as a reward for various side objectives to give a different spin to each campaign. Those unlockable pilots are veteran time travelers with unique abilities and temperament, defined by a few pixels in their portrait and a touch of good writing by Chris Avalon. At the end of each run, successful or not, you can choose one surviving pilot to embark on a new adventure, leaving the rubble of a doomed timeline behind. Let the specter to haunt their weary minds, but they keep the XP. Thus, starting a new game has an actual meaning here as traveling through time to a parallel world, adding to the believability of this universe. Great world building is an enticing side dish, but the meat of the game is composed of bite-sized battles on 64 squares in which you have to endure 4 turns of X attacks while minimizing collateral damage to human structures. But there is a crucial twist, each turn you already know where the enemies are going to attack next, and this idea pushed the development into new grounds. Familiarity with the genre and some characters' complaints may lead you to prioritizing killing all the enemies, but this self-imposed challenge is not the key to success. The real goal is to protect the buildings, which requires a complete change of perspective. In other words, the arbitrary health bar needed to measure player performance is reduced when specific squares are hit, and story-wise invisible civilians die, while the mechs are repaired for free and the pilots are actually expendable. Hmm, they have the opportunity to become heroes. Bonus quiz. What do you do if you lose a pilot? A. Compose a song for the fallen hero. Or B. 
compensate the lost upgrade by shuffling resources around. Write your choice in the comments below. I chose B because I didn't play chess to stage the tale of the knight saving the queen as a modern minimalist realization of Don Quixote imagination. In other words, retelling King Arthur's saga as a succession of legal moves on the chessboard is less effective than using a pug to protect sheep. So why am I comparing learning chess and playing into the breach? The foundation of chess is not the Staunton chess set, but the abstract set of rules that allows you to make your next move. Though the material support provided by the board and pieces is certainly helpful, you can play by shouting your moves and keeping track of the board in your head, or use gummy bears and a napkin in a pinch. Now it is time to leave behind the discussion of the equivalent of the chess set and its coats of paint and let the mechanics, the rules of the video game, take center stage in this video as they do in chess and into the breach. After the first few minutes of the game, there are no obvious tutorials to ruin the discovery process, while a solid structure of achievements and lockables stealthily guides the player towards mechanical exploration. The key ingredient of this full course meal of learning is unlocking new mechs that by design force you to drastically change your playstyle and thus expand your tactical horizons for the next encounters. This is what reminds me of my introductory lessons to chess that use puzzles to explain the game. The difference is that the teacher here is invisible and likes to set your chessboard on fire in order to spark interesting decisions, to quote the developers. To be clear, the resemblance to learning chess is not a fortunate accident. It is the natural consequence of using a scientific approach to developing a game. The one that questions general conventions and presents us with a lesson in game design. The slogan player first is one of these overused marketing words meant to be reassuring that I immediately raise suspicions instead. True effort does not need corporate catchphrases, that was what came to mind while I was listening to Justin Mai Matthew Davis, the people behind the label Subset Games, that had the opposite problem, a name meant for a niche project called FTL that just happened to interest many people because of its quality. The presentation of their second effort, Into the Breach, is functional. From the minimalistic user interface to the pixelated art style, all the design choices contribute to creating the perfect environment for you to focus on the mechanics. The UI is a reliable partner that never gets in the way and always has your back. From your first tentative steps in this new world to your last terrible decision, it provides the minimum number of on-screen indications needed to understand at a glance what is happening. Since Vex strikes are telegraphed, you need to know what they are going to do next. The no compromise solution was to discard attack types that couldn't be represented in a clear way on the map. This doesn't mean there are many enemies with slightly different attacks, each dealing one extra damage than the previous one. In fact, there is only a limited number of stylized sprites with different behaviors, explained clearly in a small window overlay at the push of button, so that you can learn how the pieces move and attack, and then forget about this built-in rulebook. The slick presentation and telegraphed attack concept made me buy the game, but I certainly didn't expect to relieve the forgotten joy of playing chess by myself. At that point, I wanted to know more, I wanted to understand why I was having fun, so I stopped playing to start listening to Matthew and Justin. The creative process they openly discussed in talks and interviews was just as interesting as the final product, with an approach to game design that reminded me of the one Galileo used in physics and astronomy, in a completely different cultural environment. It is now taken for granted that scientific theories need to be supported by experimental observations, but that wasn't always the case. We have to thank open-minded scientists like Galileo for championing critical thinking, despite the opposition of the mainstream media, that is the gatekeepers not wanting to see what was right in front of their eyes. Now we have YouTube, which is a great place where we can freely exchange ideas. In a quiet corner of the site, the people behind events such as the Game Developer Conference are doing a great job in keeping their research around the science of building games within reach of everyone as it develops. Of course, that is useless if the devs don't want to share their honest experiences, or by contract they cannot. Luckily, here I don't have to rely on second-hand accounts and conjectures. I am able to quote Justin and Matthew directly and link the sources below collected in a playlist for your convenience. First, I need to point out the obvious crucial difference between science and fictional works. The laws of nature are immutable, the developers of a game can roleplay as God. Luckily, Matthew and Justin had benevolent intentions, always asking themselves, is this new feature interesting to experience? Ready to sacrifice their previous work rather than players' time after launch on the altar of we we'll fix it later if players first give us enough money. So, how to judge if a theory or game works? 
by testing it of course, which is easier said than done. While playing around with the game mechanics, the laws of their made-up world, Justin and Matthew realized by trial and error that if they wanted to truly follow the original ideas for the game, they needed to reject previous assumptions. Genre standards are ready to eat solutions to common old problems, while taste innovations are produced from new questions. In other words, if we want to create something new, we need to give up the old comforting routine or gameplay loop and relearn how to play. As a bonus, not following the beaten path allows the devs to be surprised while exploring their own game during development and to have fun learning and discovering along the way just like players experiencing something new. Meanwhile, students are brainwashed to think that learning is parroting the teacher. Into the Breach is Matthew and Justin's answer to the video games they played without accepting blindly the baggage of the genre and thus going back to its roots from board games down to the venerable ancestor, chess. In 2019's GDC talk, Into the Breach Postmortem, their method is presented clearly and concisely. And here's my take on it. I present to you the three steps for building a small, interesting game. Establish a set of ideas, find its implications by trial and error, and then ruthlessly cut the necessary features. The first step is to set some initial constraints, that is the rules needed to define the boundaries of the game, since a restrained creativity, like mismanagement, results in repeated delays and awkward releases. In the case of Into the Breach, the highlight is a simple assumption with momentous implications. Each turn is completely deterministic, which means enemy attacks are shown in advance and there are no hit chances. Of course, any AI needs randomness to simulate the decisions of a human opponent, for example, to determine which squares to attack, but here all that is done before the start of your turn. Once the stage is set, there is no RNG involved. You never miss? The VEC never miss either, though buildings can be miraculously shielded sometimes. Yes, there is a small chance to avoid damage to the player's life bar so that a flicker of hope remains when pressing the enter button in a desperate situation, because the devs are way too nice. I fully understand, of course, the computer cannot really appreciate the desperation in the eyes of the helpless opponent being crushed move after move. After setting the foundations and boundaries, it is time to create a working example and see what happens, or in scientific terms, test the initial assumptions through experiments. We have telegraphed attacks and mechs that can be easily moved aside while I quote, buildings don't have legs, which ultimately resulted in a twist of the usual formula of annihilating the enemy army, the strategy closer to buying time for a retreat than a full-blown battle. Following the most interesting gameplay in the prototypes, priority was given to avoiding collateral damage, even if it meant self-sacrifice to protect the city. The true hero is not the omnipotent protagonist, but he who can lay down his own life for a greater good, or so they say. This matched the original concept of the game, which was to focus on saving the human dwellings during the fight, rather than on having as many expensive special effects as possible to satisfy their old repressed desire to stomp at the little Timmy Sun castle. Moreover, the most interesting aspect of the battle is not manipulating the enemies, because telegraphed attacks will always land, but you can decide where, and this is unique gameplay worth exploring. Instead of the usual kill all the enemies to win, here we have to endure 5 turns, after which the VEC conveniently leave, avoiding awkward moments like before contact in XCOM or when the opponent is too stubborn to forfeit in chess. The result is that every turn is impactful, no time is wasted, and so there is a great value to our ratio as entertainment for your brain. Lastly, there is the most painful and exhilarating part, taking out pieces of the game corresponding to many hours of work, which may seem crazy, but it happens regularly when researching something new in any field, even for this video. Cutting a diamond in the rough just makes it sparkle more. No team, it doesn't work in the same way with that butterfly, let it go. For example, the success of the new XCOM makes it an alluring blueprint for any turn-based tactical game development and an inevitable term of comparison for any release. Its influence here is not so apparent because Justin and Matthew ultimately cut most of the XCOM-inspired strategy layer, along with everything else that wasn't engaging or functional, and that brought into the breach in a new direction. After seeing the results, the initial preferences in step 1 can be tweaked and the whole cycle repeats until satisfaction is reached. In this case, it took four years of development, with many ideas and months of work scrapped, to obtain a game that is closer to chess moment by moment, and has clear still frames of interesting decisions, tasty morsels for the brain. But it is from a bird's eye view on the timeline that its true nature is finally revealed. As a puzzle game, 
in disguise. Before computers and almighty eyes, the closest you could get to playing chess on your own was analyzing a given position, the simplest puzzle being why to move, mating and moves. Unfortunately, the complexity of the game makes it impossible to target a large section of the vast skill spectrum in one chess puzzle collection called single, single player, player chess. chess. The game. On the opposite side of accessibility, crosswords, Sudoku and Candy Crush have become popular due to their simplicity, at the price of an almost flat learning curve. Another step towards the perfect biscuit clicker game to savior with the blend of dystopian future tea of your choice. In my ideal puzzle collection game, I'd like to see immediately an insurmountable obstacle and then embark on a long journey of discovery around it, acquiring the abstract tools for exploration as in a good metroidvania, until I'm able to tackle the highest peak of the system. Finally noticing all the possibilities in a video game is proof that we have learned something about that world, which triggers the primal satisfaction of seeing a potential new tool where everybody else sees only a rock and a stick. I'm using the term puzzle here in its broadest sense as a test of human ingenuity, and this series will discuss the most interesting ones in video games, including tactics and strategy, as we bounce along tense strings of questions from creators to players. I call this brainy hopping. My goal is to show you the clockworks behind the pretty pixels, because the creativity behind the scenes is the difference between good games and great ones. So, in this perspective, the campaign of Into the Breach is a randomized collection of puzzles that teaches you how to get better at solving them, instead of frustratingly blocking your progress if you don't see the only answer respected by the author as in many adventure games. If the focus of a video game is the story, it makes sense to keep the puzzles simple and the tale flowing. But adventure games have a long history of convoluted solutions that can be only found by entering the mind of the developer, instead of using our own brain. If the devs instead disappear behind the world they created, the player is truly at the center of the survival experience in a harsh world of logic. Here, the problems arise naturally from the interacting mechanics, the laws of the game world, and there is always room for errors. Less preferable alternatives provide escape routes that can be even more satisfying than the ideal solution in the long run, since the thrill of gambling is more powerful than cold calculations. Into the Breach is easy to pick up and has short missions conveniently collected in islands and campaigns to fit in any time interval you want. So the question is, how does it manage to be simple and challenging at the same time? Well, it takes full advantage of its virtual board, providing variety by constantly changing the pieces. Changing the starting max has by far the biggest impact. Each squad focuses on a different mechanic, and understanding how that works in relation to the other rules is required to complete the achievements needed to unlock the next one. Although there are also more traditional challenges to provide alternative ways to those shining new mechs. The result is that we can understand more about the game in a compelling progression not of numbers going up, but of logical discoveries. Experimenting with new toys to learn more about the world and I really hope that this is not a toy manufacturer's slogan. For example, the first squad was chosen to highlight that you can push the VEC out of the way and they cannot swim, hint hint. In a few hours you will be rearranging enemies so that they hit each other, and that's all I'm going to say in case you haven't played the game yet. Instead of ruining the fun of the discovery, I'm going to reveal the not so well kept secret behind this game, that is the behavior of the VEC which is mentioned implicitly or explicitly in every article and review, and may or may not change how you play the game. Here it is. The AI in Into the Breach does not calculate all possibilities as in a chess match. You could say there is no grandmaster strategist or brilliant hive mind behind the VEC. But as much was clear from the fact that they patiently wait for your arrival and then conveniently retreat after only five turns, am I right? Quite the opposite. You will find everywhere the racial insensitive expression, the VEC are dumb. And this summarizes the fact that each enemy acts independently, following simple rules, such as attack the nearest mech, or look for occupied squares matching its weapon pattern. There is no planning ahead. It's now or never, I'm gonna live forever, I just want to live while I'm alive. They may be singing. The final result is successful solely because of particular preparations. According to the devs, there are around 200 map layouts in the game, carefully selected to avoid unsolvable situations as much as possible. 
The spawning is randomized between available tiles, but the number of spawns is determined by difficulty and current number of enemies on the board. There is also a limit on the number of attacking VEC as a fail-safe mechanism, because the drawback of the simplicity of the system is that an extra piece can change a difficult puzzle into an impossible one. Since the game is not able to calculate if your current weapon loadout is enough to solve a particular situation, it needs a factory speed limiter, so to speak, on the number of enemies emerging and attacking. This limitation calls for custom puzzles from devs and players to create the best challenges this system can offer. Except that neither Matthew nor Justin is eager to add advanced trials or a puzzle creator to rival Mario Maker. Even though there is a hidden and finished debug scenario creator that could be used to share situations in which you can be certain that there is a brilliant way out to be found. Imagine the satisfaction of completing a custom mission in which you are at number 4 to 1, with the VEX movement set in advance, of course. Or the delight of being able to build this scenario in the first place. I see playing to the bridge as driving a Ferrari around town. It is definitely a great experience, but deep down you wonder how fun it would be to let it loose on the track. But let me know if you agree with me or if I'm thinking too much about chess puzzles and Hitman. Having challenges expire in the Hitman reboot was definitely not fun. So if the lack of extra content is a price to pay for interesting offline dear and free single player games, I'm okay with that. I can't wait. Until I start doing prank videos and buy my own Ferrari. In the meantime, we have the freedom to make the campaign as challenging as possible. From speedruns to more creative pacifist runs, try out any one of the 3654 mech combinations with repetitions. But you don't need to make up new rules for yourself to test the engine, there's already a rating system based on the initial protect the civilians objective that can highlight the game's issues. It's the same idea behind a high score at the arcade but with the sense of closure that a pinball machine doesn't have, since it maxes out at 30k or less, depending on your choices. You can tackle the final mission after 2, 3 or 4 islands with the enemies in it scaling accordingly. As Justin and Matthew saw the length of the campaign as a personal preference. Do you prefer to try new weapons and upgrades or keep the things short and simple, like a day at the beach? Tell me about your latest crush in the comments. The maximum final score depends on the chosen length and difficulty. And to brag at the bar about your high score, the fabled 30k run, you need to finish a 4 island campaign on hard without any damage to buildings. To be extra cool, you can complete every side objective to get 4 perfect island congratulations cards, which actually help with extra rewards. Unfortunately, the harder the challenge, the bigger the role luck plays, from the spawning locations to the island's layout, since some missions are better than others for a specific squad and some objectives may be actually impossible for your custom one. If you instead prefer to add a bit more variety to your plate, you're in luck. There's a small but competent modding community. Whether you want to get your hands dirty with Lua scripts or just try a free fan-made DLC, I'll link below mod list and instructions from the Subset Games forums. To summarize, after unlocking everything and mastering the mechanics, the introductory course is over, but Into the Breach is not. Whether you want to create new challenges or your own heroic tale, what remains now is the true naked game, a handcrafted chest like sandbox with an exquisitely simple built-in puzzle generator. And as in any sandbox, there is no definite ending, we are free to experiment to heart's content until we find a new game, a new world to conquer. Thank you for watching. Valente.